It's great to have you with us tonight, and so welcome. Good evening. I want you to turn with me, if you bought a Bible or it's on your phone or whatever, I want to, I want to turn to an unusual story in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 13, and draw some applications from that for our prayer life. And we'll begin reading with verse 14. Second Kings, chapter 13, verse 14. Now, Elisha was suffering from the illness from which he died. Jehoash, the king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows. And he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot. Elisha said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the Armenians at Aphek. Then he said, take the arrows. And the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. What on earth does that story mean? What a strange story. Let me give you the background of, of the story and then we'll get right into the heart of it. This was the last thing that Elisha, the prophet, did before he died. So he's on his deathbed and the king of Israel comes to pay his respects. Now, you have to understand that a prophet in those days was a national figure. In fact, there was a sense in which he stood alongside the king. So in that culture, you had these three leading personalities. You, there was the priest, there was the king, and there was the prophet. The king had power in his domain, but the prophet spoke for God. And so he was a national figure, and when he's dying, it behooves the king to come and pay his last respects. And so that's why Jehoash is here. Now, it's not that the king really had much to do with Elisha. You see, Jehoash came from a bad line. In fact, he has a reputation written in his genealogy. The Bible record describes him as being the man who made Israel to sin. Now, you'll read that several times in the Old Testament, and who that's referring to is a man by the name of Jeroboam. When Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became king. But there was a split between the kingdom, and two tribes stayed with Rehoboam. Ten tribes went with a man by the name of Jeroboam. Now, while they were divided politically, they were not divided religiously. They had a common city and a common temple to which they wished to worship. And so Jeroboam reasoned in his mind, if the people continue to be one, religiously, they, eventually they'll revert back, came one politically. They'll, they'll, they'll kill me. They'll all go back to Rehoboam and I'll lose my position. So to keep that from happening, he deliberately set about the destruction of the religion of the people that he governed. And the way he went about, about that speaks well for his keen insight and shrewd understanding into human nature. And he didn't try to make war on religion in, in specifically because he knew better than to do that. Man's incurably religious. He will have something to worship. If he doesn't worship God, if nothing else, he'll worship himself, which is what humanism is. We're incurably religious. But what he did do is say something like this. Now, while it's perfectly all right to go up to Jerusalem, 
It's just costing you too much time and trouble. And, and it's all right to worship like your forefathers did, but it just isn't necessary. I'm going to show you an easier way. You can put a golden calf right here in your own village, and you can get along just as great. Now, there's nothing wrong with worshiping like your mom and dad used to, but just isn't necessary in this day and time. And, and so the easy way was met with readily acceptance that the people bought into it. So he put one in Dan and one in Bethel. In other words, top and bottom of the kingdom. And this thing became a sin, the Bible says, and it's why God ultimately destroyed them because they went into idolatry. You see, we love the easy way. It's part of the reason why we don't pray as much as we ought to because it's hard work. When you really get in earnest, then the devil starts messing around with you, your mind, and all kinds of things going on. We love the easy way. Traveling like I do as an evangelist, I, I stay in a lot of homes. Uh, most of them, I see a lot of high-tech athletic equipment in there with about two inches of dust on them. <laughs> Why? Because somebody in that infomercial told us, you know, if you buy this, I mean, it'll just be a piece of cake. You won't have to sweat or do anything like that. I remember years ago coming into a revival service on Wednesday night and there was a storm broke just as I was unloading things out of my car into the motel room and and so I thought I probably ought to check and see what you know what this storm is going to be like so I turned on the TV and I don't know what the law of averages are but if you turn on the TV you're mostly going to get a commercial or an infomercial or something and this infomercial came on and this man was telling us about this marvelous scientific discovery a little package of pills and seemingly the way he described it, if you bought those pills and took them, if you were having a struggle, if you were struggling with weight, I mean, it just seemingly would drain right off of you. And I thought about some friends of mine who, who, who have some of that kind of trouble. And I thought, you know, I want to buy that for them. And then I thought, no, I probably shouldn't. Because if it comes off that fast, they'll drown in bed while they're trying to sleep. <laughs> So maybe I shouldn't do that, you know. See, see we love the easy way. And so when, when you read in the Bible about the man who made Israel to sin, that's, that's Jeroboam. And, and the writer here in 2 Kings is telling us that Jehoash was just like that. Now, it's not that the king had much time for this prophet. It's just something that kings have to do when prophets are dying because it's just part of the political surrounding. And so I want you to notice the context. Let me back up here. I clicked that twice. Elisha, he, he's dying. Uh, Jehoash, he, he has inherited a defeated kingdom. And he's paying a state visit to the prophet. Now, he's got a lot on his mind as the king because his father, who had been of the same character, had been defeated in earlier years by Syria. And they had wiped out most of their army, took away all their chariots and weapons of war, and basically reduced them to slavery. And so Jehoash had inherited this defeated people, and he lives under the shadow of Syria all the time. And he knows that the chances are that when he, the history of his life is written, he's going to go down in history as one who could quite, not, not quite set his people free. I want to tell you, I wouldn't have wanted to give the State of the Union address being in his shoes because it was not a very pretty picture. And so he's paying a state visit. Now, in that mode of mind, he goes to see the prophet, who as far as he's concerned doesn't really matter, but he's there, and so you've got to go see him because that's the way the country operates. And, and besides all that, he is a weird man to boot. He, he does strange things. He's a mystic. And the king doesn't think in those terms. He, he thinks in terms of government and politics and armies. And so he goes to see Elisha, and as he walks in, the old man is on his deathbed. Now, everybody knows that this is a terminal illness. And as the king walks in, Elisha said, take your bow and arrow. Now, in our today's language, that's your nuclear war <laughs> weapons, okay? And so the king obeys. I mean, what else are you going to do? you you gotta, you got to humor this senile old man. And then Elisha says, open the window over there to the east. And so he opens the window. Now, over there beyond the horizon is Syria, the hated enemy. But immediately outside the window is Elisha's backyard. And then Elisha tells him, come here. And so he goes over to the bed where this eccentric old prophet is. And the king says, now, I'm going to put my hands on top of yours. 
And then it tells the king, now, now with my hands on top of yours, pull the bow. And so he does. And then Elisha says, shoot. And the arrow goes out the window and lands in Elisha's backyard. Now, as soon as that happens, Elisha sets up and he's all excited. Now, let's look at the symbolism of this a little bit. You see, war in those days was declared by shooting an arrow toward the enemy border. If you were going to go to war with a country, you would get your army together and you would get on your horse and you would lead them to the boundary line between your country and that country you were going to war with. And as the king, you would take an arrow out of your quiver, notch it in a bow, and shoot it over into the enemy territory. And by doing that, you're declaring war. Okay? So, so the king understands something of the symbolism of this, okay? But the Syrians are way, way over there. And Elisha sets up and he's so excited. And, and he declares that, that by shooting that arrow over across the border enemy, that, 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 that that there's going to come a time when there's going to be a battle between him and the Syrians, and he's going to win this marvelous battle, and he's going to come out from under bondage. And in case he had any doubt about that, Elisha is so excited. I mean, this is the old man who's just about to die, but all of a sudden, when he's doing this, he's got this new energy level, and he's up, and he's excited, and his eyes are flashing. Now, put yourself in the king's shoes. Um, the king, well, let me go back. There's some things missing here, but okay, but I'm, I'm going to give them to you so you can get them. Put yourself in Jehoash's head. You're a king, you're a military man, you're a, you're a politician. This is all very foreign to him, this mystical stuff. I mean, he gets the drift of it, but, but the fact that they are far away from Syria, true, it's over in that direction, but I mean, be, let's be realistic. The, the arrow landed in Elisha's backyard. And they're not confronting Syria, and they're not up against the borders, and, and they didn't, it didn't even land in their territory, and yet this old man is saying that we have just won a great victory over Syria by shooting an arrow out the window. And the king is thinking, come on, man, we're in this bedroom. Now, let's get real here. I'm a military man. When, when we talk about battles, we're, we're talking about front lines and generals and soldiers and strategy and chariots. Okay? And it, we're talking about weapons of war. And, and we're talking about hill position and water, uh, I, I mean, how in the world could shooting an arrow out of a window, when we're in a bedroom today, have anything to do with the battle going to be won in the future, and the battle won't even be in the backyard, it'll actually be over there on the borders of Syria. How, how could any exercise so foolish and insignificant as shooting an arrow out the window make any difference in the real world. Now, that's the human perspective. But let's look at the divine perspective. You remember? It does not want to stay there. <laughs> remember we learned last week that we're not robots. That God has put us in a co-working relationship with him. And that he is seen in the world through what we do. The behaviors that we have. The activities that we get engaged in. Okay. So Elisha moves his hands. And, and he's just made this declaration. That God himself has promised that there's going to be a power. There's going to be a strength given to Jehoash's army. To overcome those that have held him in slavery so long. But now Elisha says, I'm going to take my hands off, and it's up to you, Jehoash. Now take the remainder of the arrows out of your quiver, and so Jehoash complies reluctantly. I mean, he's trying to humor this senile old man. Now Elisha says, get down on the floor. Can you figure out just what's going on in this king's mind about right now? 
It's then kings don't get down on the floor and grovel. But I got to do, I want to get out of here. And, but the only way I can get out of here is to do what this old man wants me to do. And then Elisha says, hit the floor. Or putting it in our language, go get them. Bash the Syrians. And the king is muttering to himself, how absolutely ridiculous. I don't have time to play war games. We're not on a battlefront. We're on a carpet. There aren't any soldiers here. And Syria is miles away. You're saying hit Syria, bash Syria. This is like a monopoly game. Oh, brother, if the Secretary of Defense could see me behaving like this. But I got to get through with this silly project. And so half-heartedly, he hits the floor three times with the arrows. And in that moment, Elisha looks at him, and the light goes out of his eyes. And he says to the king, is that all you could do? God said, God promised you complete victory, and you took three half-hearted attempts. Now, what in the world? does this story mean for us? Well, it's a mime. It's a word picture. It's a symbol. You see, you decide how much of God's victory you want to claim. Do you understand what's being said here? Well, what the king did with God's promise, God said, I've given you the victory. It's my hand on yours, but it's not going to be implemented or a complete finished act until you decide how much you want to take of the victory that I've given you. Does that make sense to you at all? This is a promise of God. It's an object lesson. And you see this a lot in the Old Testament. God said, I'm going to give you the victory and it's as good as done, but... I'm not going to do it by myself. You see, we're, we're, we're not robots. We're not a puppet on a string. He said, now you decide how much you want to draw on my promise. You decide how much of the victory you want to claim for yourself. In the king's case, he's bored. He's embarrassed by what he thinks is still a war game. And so he hits the floor three times to get it all over with. But there's a very significant paragraph at the end of the chapter that says it sadly records that Jehoash had three victories against Syria and they sort of came out from their slavery but nothing about what they could have done and so because of Jehoash's response to the promise of God because he only decided to take half-heartedly three strikes with the arrows a people suffered a nation suffered and he went down in history as a king who never quite made it now you say brother can what what's the principle here well, uh, let, me, let me enlarge on it a minute. Y you see, this principle is foundational to our understanding of the Bible. This is the way that God has chosen to work in our lives and to work on this earth. And if you can get a hold of this, you will understand a lot about Scripture you didn't understand before. That God works in our lives by promising us what he will do. When we implement that in our lives, in our churches, in our families, in our cities, in our nation, incredible things begin to happen. Now, God has made known to us his love plans. All of you know the passage of Scripture over this area. I know the plans that I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. He, he makes known to us in Scripture, and he also makes known to us in nudges in our heart by the Holy Spirit. So, now, there are times when I know how Jehoash felt. Because here's this book called the Bible, and it's filled with promises made by God so many years ago, and yet he is now, at this time and in this place, nudging me to shoot an arrow of faith against the things that defeat me today and keep me in bondage and strangle the life out of my church. And it seems a little strange, and it seems all a little mystical. And you may be saying right now, Brother Covington, are, are, are you saying that God spoke and his words were rendered down anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 years ago? We, we think that's about how old the book of Job is. And another time he's saying that in this time and in this geography, God's 
own power will be released into my life and I will have victory where I've only known defeat and I will know joy where there's only been depression and I will know peace and harmony where there's only been disruption and hell on earth. I understand a little bit about how G.O.S. felt. I mean, what do you mean standing in a bedroom or riding in my pickup truck that God is saying to me that he will give us a victory, but it'll be in another time frame and another geography. But if I pray and claim his promises, something will happen in my life. But you see, this is how God works. <laughs> You're going to have to help me up there. It wants to do two at a time. Um, see, what he has promised to do, he will give his power to accomplish. But he brings us into the act as partners. And the amount of victory is determined by our faith and our obedience and our commitment to do our part in the process. By our willingness to customize God's promises to fit the situation that we face at this time, in our lives. I mean, God has made vast promises about changing lives, about power entering into us, work that's greater than the power of the evil, that Jesus Christ was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. I mean, they're great words. They're wide words. And here I am in a situation, and, and, and I'm saying, Lord, in this situation, I need this. If we're going to carry out this plan for you, we need this and we need this and this person needs this spiritual gift and we need these kind of financial resources. And we tell God what it is that we need out of his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And he brings those to us. Um, here I am in a situation where evil has destroyed my children the works of the devil and his fingerprints are everywhere. Now God says, how much of my promise do you want to apply to this situation? When you pray, think about all the promises that I have given in the word. And of course, then you need to know the word to know what's available. God's saying, I've said I'll defeat. How much do you want? Ask, God says, and we'll be partners together in this. I will do it, but, but you won't be a robot, and, and you'll be a cooperating partner, and you'll say, Lord, in this situation I'm in, I need this much, and I need this much, and whatever is needed in that situation, I ask, and God says, I'll work, but I'll work through you. Do you remember what Paul said over in Ephesians? And God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above, above all we ask or even think according to what? The power that's at work in us. See the correlation? God's able to do all these things, but he set this world up for you and I to be co-working partners with him and to determine what happens. Now you may be saying, Brother Covington, are, are you saying that my talking to an invisible God and asking him to do what he said he would do and wants to do is going to affect the lives of people who may not even be here and, and, and maybe who live in another geography and may even live halfway around the world? See, that's where we get very close to what was happening in Elisha's bedroom. Let me give you an example. Some of you are too young to remember this. Some of you watched this on television in 1989. How many of you have ever heard of a man called Brother Andrew? Have any of you? A few of you have. Uh, Brother Andrew was, was referred to as God's smuggler. For 30 years, he smuggled Bibles into Iron Curtain countries. Now, when we use this word smuggle, we're thinking that he somehow got those in his station wagon and covered them all up with blankets and whatever and covered up with other kind of stuff. No, 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 he didn't. He stacked them with the Bible up on top, Holy Bible, all the way up to the windows. And then he would stop about two miles from the checkpoint going into any particular country. He would pray and he said, Lord, don't let them see my Bibles. And then he would drive to the checkpoint and show his papers, and they would look at those, and then they'd look in his car and say, you're clear. 30 years he did that, and they never saw 
his Bibles. Okay? Well, he wrote a delightful little book, he and Suvin DeVore, called And God Changed His Mind. You can still get this on Amazon, even though it was written 20 years ago. It is a delightful book based on the intercessory prayer of Moses that will teach you a great deal. And he titled it, And God Changed His Mind, for a very specific reason. See, a lot of us have this idea that because God is sovereign, it means that we can never change his mind about anything. That's not true. Look at Moses. When he comes down off of the mountain, God sends him down there and says, they're already having an orgy. They've built a golden calf. He'd been up there 40 days and 40 nights, and God had written on the tablets of stone. And when he gets down there and sees all that going on, God says, I'm going to wipe them all out. And I'm going to start all over with you. That's pretty heady stuff. I mean, we started with Abraham, remember? He's saying, I'm going to wipe them all out. But Moses interceded. And said, Lord, if you're going to do that, just, just take my name out of the book of life. Whoa. Pretty heady. He said, you know, you brought them all the way out of Egypt. What, what, are, people, what are people going to say if you wipe them all out now? They say, oh, yeah, he, he parted the Red Sea and took them to the desert. And, and then he couldn't get them all the way in the promised land, so he just wiped them out. <laughs> God changed his mind. Because he interceded and prayed for them and said, have mercy. You're a merciful God. Don't, don't, don't wipe them out and don't start all over with me. <laughs> Lord, redeem these people in spite of the jerks that they are. So he wrote this book. I, I want to read something to you. Moses understood this facet of God's character as few men ever have and the Bible gives us plenty of examples to help us understand how we can relate to God the same way he did. And it's that story in Exodus I read to you. Now, in 1983, he had an organization called Open Doors. And it was a ministry used to, to get the gospel into Iron Curtain countries. And he and his leaders began to pray, and they came to the conclusion that Satan's headquarters in the world must be in Moscow. It's where all the wicked stuff was coming from. So many believers were in prison, thousands of them. And, and he said, so we, we began to pray, and we even asked God, to make this change, to, to change their hearts in the Iron Curtain countries and to let us in there and preach the gospel. They started praying in 1983. Some of them would go to the borders of those countries and spend their two-week vacation sitting in a car every day praying for the walls to come down. Many of them went to the wall of Berlin and would pray two weeks at a time for that wall to come down. Do you, do you remember what started happening in 1989? They said, Lord, we'd like for you to do this in seven years. Do you remember, do you remember how amazed the news commentators were when those walls began to crumble and people rose up and threw off their dictators and opened the door that all happened because a group of Christians got together and said, let's change our world. When I tell you that we can bring a genuine Holy Ghost revival to this country, I really believe that. I really mean that. There's enough people in this room tonight to start that significantly. And maybe even suggest to God a time frame. They did. I, I don't know how God would. He did it here. Look. After 1989, 
After more than 30 years of smuggling Bibles behind the Iron Curtain, I challenged the Russians openly to allow our organization to distribute a million Russian language Bibles to Soviet churches. Incredibly, they said yes. And at this moment, now keep in mind this was written 20 years ago. At this moment, still less than seven years after we began praying, we are able to report to our prayer partners the glorious news that not a single Christian leader remains in a prison or concentration camp in the Soviet Union for his faith. That, my friend, is what happens when we pray. We have incredible power. And the enemy has just done a snow job on us. And convinced us that we don't have any authority, that we don't have any significance. So what, what keeps us from living a lifestyle like that? Intimidation. You see, if I'm going to be intimidated, then I'm going to forfeit my family and my world and my city and my church to those who have set themselves up against the Lord. And so what was God's answer to that? You remember when we read it last week in Psalm 2? He who sits in the heaven does what? Laughs. Oh, really? They're going to stop me? They're going to keep me from answering your prayers? Really? He said, I've established my king on his holy hill. I'll tell you what I'll do. While they're making all their laws and while they're doing all these things, you ask of me and I'll give you the ends of the world. I'll give you the, I'll give you the islands. Because my son has won the right back for all of this. So, bash the floor with your spiritual arrows. Ask me, he said, customize my promises and my power to your local situation. Customize what I promised to your family and then join me in laughter when I bring all of this to pass. Now, let's look at what seems like a strange principle here from another angry. Let's talk about food for a moment. If we followed our practice logic in eating like we do in prayer, we would all die. I mean, since God is all-powerful and he's all-wise and he's all-loving, if he wants me to eat, he'll just feed me, right? And if he wants to take me home, well, he'll just do that whenever. Well, you know that isn't how it works. We learned earlier that God gave man some responsibilities at creation, and one of the laws of creation is that you have to provide yourself some food sometime during the day, and if you violate that principle of creation, you will die, and God cannot, and he will not stop you, because that's the way you were created. It's a law. It's a principle. You're responsible to feed yourself, and God isn't going to feed you. You say, well, what that has to do with it? Well, you're also responsible to pray. You're responsible to respond to his promises and to take what is needed of that promise in your specific local situation and say, Father, we need this. You see, the Bible clearly teaches us that the Son of Man was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. And so you don't have to wonder if it's God's will for some evil to cease. Jesus said, I've come to destroy the works of the devil. He meant it. And to put it in our context of our story, in 2 Kings, he shot his arrow right out of the tomb. When Jesus came out of the grave on Easter Sunday morning, he shot his arrow. And we learned last week about a safety deposit box. And it takes two keys, right? And God said, look, I've already stuck my key in. I raised my son out of the grave. Now, you stick your key in. You pray. You ask me. You get to know my promises. And you believe me for them. And we'll shake this world in response to how I work through you and in you, and sometimes in spite of you, <laughs> sometimes. You say, well, Brother Compton, why, why, why isn't it so? 
Well, because it wastes implementation by our asking God to do what he's told us that he wills to do, but wills to do with us, because it's the law of creation. We were made by him to be co-workers, and he's not going to do something in this world without one of us. That's the way he set the law up. I want you to listen to a text. Over there in 2 Corinthians, whoops. 2 Corinthians 1, 19 and 20. You ought to mark this in your Bible. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no. But in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Did you hear what Paul just said? It's not sometimes yes and sometimes no. He's saying it's always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they're yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken to us to the glory of God. When we start cooperating with God and leaning on those promises and having faith in those promises and trusting God to carry it out. He said, well, Brother Compton, how how does this work in logic? Well, sometimes I have to submit my logic to the Holy Spirit. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that we'll do irrational things. But things done in the spirit realm don't always fit my classroom learning or logic. The Bible is full of examples of this. So, Brother Governor, what will happen if we lay aside our ideas of how it works and pray, what will happen? Well... If we hit the floor with our arrows, we'll find that when we get there on the front lines with our own version of Syria, we'll have strength we didn't know we had. And we'll find wisdom for strategy. And we will find that our enemies are overcome with weakness and fear and that all they really want to do is run away. Let me remind you of some Bible examples. You remember Joshua at Jericho? What was the strategy? To walk around once a day for seven days. Say nothing. Can you guess why God told Joshua to tell the people not to say anything? Can't you just hear some Israelite? That is the dumbest thing I ever heard of in my life. Just marching around. Do they think these walls are going to fall down? You know? I mean, there are always people. Well, we, I mean, the famous seven last words of the church are, we've never done it that way before. You remember when Elijah was up on Mount Carmel challenging the 480 prophets of Baal? Remember, he built an altar and cut up 12 bulls, and then they hauled up 12 barrels of water. Now, I think he had to build the altar, and I think he had to cull up the bulls, but I don't think he had to carry up the water, because there's always somebody willing to pour cold water on your sacrifice. (laughs) Well, how much does that cost? I I mean, did God go broke yesterday? See, that's why Joshua said, don't say anything. Just walk. And then on the seventh day, they go around seven times and shout and blow the trumpet. What happens to the walls? Not your typical military strategy. Okay, King David. The Amalekites are coming up. He says to the Lord, should I fight them? Will I, will I win? Will you help me win? Yes. But wait till you hear a, muslin, a, a, a rustling in the mulberry trees. Really? 
What did that mean? It meant God was out front. That's where I want him to be. If I'm going into war. Not your typical military strategy, but it worked. Remember Hezekiah? He gets that letter from Sennacherib. And he's mocking him and said, I'll, I'll give you 2,000 horses if you've got men to put on them. He, he knew he didn't have them. And he's blaspheming God and he's saying, all the other gods of all these other nations I've conquered, it didn't make any difference and, and your God isn't going to make any difference. And so Hezekiah takes that letter and he goes into the temple and he lays it down on the altar and he stretches out over it and says, what are you going to do, God? And we know all those other gods are nobody, but you're God. What are you going to do with this? And the prophet Isaiah comes in and tells him, don't worry about it. God's got your back. And during the night, the angel of the Lord comes and kills 186,000 of them. That'll get your general's attention. <laughs> and he leaves. And he wrote that in his own history. Okay? He wrote about that experience. It really happened. Okay? What about Jehoshaphat? Remember when he's outnumbered five to one? What did God tell him to do? You're going to love this, Gabe. He said, put the choir out front. I wonder how many volunteers you'd have for the worship team. <laughs> oh, really, God? You want the choir out front? C couldn't we have soldiers and then, then the worship team? Not your typical military strategy. But did it work? Well, of course it did. Because God gave the instructions. Say, okay, Brother Compton, how, how much do I know how to ask for? Well, the Holy Spirit is in you to teach you that. But see, it takes time to develop that kind of a relationship with God. And to be honest about it, in our culture, we zip and zoom and zig and zag. And we won't give God that kind of time. I mean, remember we learned last week, this is war. We're in war. We have an adversary who is clever and powerful in his own right. The good news is greater is in me than he that's in the world. But, but we have an adversary. We're, we're at war. And if ever there was a generation that needed to give some quality time to God... It's us. And that won't just happen. You'll have to plan for that to happen. I mean, the devil will see to it. It's never convenient to do that. But if you've got the Holy Spirit in you, you he'll be prompting you. You won't hit the floor three times when you ought to hit it six. He'll stay on you in a spirit of prayer. He'll say, you, you keep asking. <laughs> you keep with me. You stay with me. I'll prompt you. It just takes time. And, and you see, the problem with us is we're too busy with our own war game. We're, we're building sermons. We're attending meetings. We're, reaching, we're reading church growth principles. We're mixing with people because those are tangible tools for us like armies and bows and arrows and hill position were for Jehoash. But relationship is everything to success in the war with the world, the flesh, and the devil. There's a wonderful promise over here in, in John's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 5 through 16, Jesus said, I'll just summarize it. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And, and prayer is the key. Uh, let me close tonight. By, by telling you a story. I, t I told you earlier that one of the most awesome experiences I ever had I owed to the prayers of a five-year-old. In 1990, I did a revival in Shreveport, Louisiana at the First Church of the Nazarene there. 
And I met a couple there that I had actually known the husband when he was 12 years old. His father pastored a church 12 miles south from where I was pastoring at the time, and I was in their home many times, and his father and I would go to hospital calls together. But as pastors do, he, he got a call to another church and, and, and left, and so I lost contact with him. And John grew up and went to Mid-American Nazarene University, met Karen, they got married, and had this little gal called Kristen. And, and when I met Kristen, Kristen was five years old. And her daddy introduced me to it the first night of revival. And, and I can't explain this. I don't, I don't know how it worked. But Kristen and I just struck up this relationship. And so every night when they would come to church and let her out in the parking lot, she would make a beeline for the sanctuary to trade hugs with me. And this went on all week. And we would go out after service to different places. And Friday night, we, we went out to Mazio's pizza place. And we're there so long, they're actually stacking chairs and mopping the floor. And I think they're going to give us some if we don't leave. And John said, I guess, I guess we ought to go. And I said, yeah, we really should. And you, you probably should have Christian in bed. And he said, well, we're not through talking, Nathan. Let's come out to the house. And I said, well, okay. Uh, we, can, we can go out there for a little while. We'll put Christian to bed. Well, Christian didn't want to go to bed. And so she sat on my lap, and we read stories till about 1 o'clock. And we put her to bed. And then I, I talked with John and Karen, and she had experienced several miscarriages. His company had transferred him to Shreveport, and you know how companies sometimes do, they make promises and then they don't deliver. So things were, were dark for them. And so I talked to them till three o'clock in the morning, and so we went on through the service, the Sunday night came, and Tristan, uh, Kristen and I traded our last hug together in the parking lot, and I got in the car and, and drove to Texas for a revival meeting, and then I went on from there without going home to Colorado. And Thursday night, the pastor said to me, um, our teens are involved in quizzing, and there's a big quiz meet tomorrow. Do you want to go? And I said, no, I, I really don't. I, I said, I want to stay here and pray because think, think that we're just really in a powerful struggle here with dark forces, and I just want to stay here. So they left about 5 o'clock, and I slept till 8, which is kind of unusual for me. But when I woke up, there was this oppressive spirit waiting for me in my room and just began to bombard my mind. I quoted scripture. I challenged it. And my wife and I were praying from some extended family members. Their, their marriages were, were coming unglued at the seams and it looked like they were going to wind up in divorce. And we were interceding for them. And, and the devil said to me, we got them. No matter what you do, we're going to tear it apart. And he just beat me up. I tried to call a couple of my prayer partners, couldn't get a hold of anybody. And so by the time 5 o'clock came in the evening, I, I would slow down my feet, would dangle off a curb. And God had told me earlier that week on Tuesday, he said, I, on, on Friday night, I want you to pray from Psalm 1833. He makes my feet like hind's feet and sets me on my high places. And I said, God, that ain't going to preach. I don't know what you're going to do with that, but, but I'm not preaching that. And so the pastor and I had been meeting an hour early before the services to pray, and he wanted to do that, so we went. And, and, and my prayers were just, just about as high as the altar. And we spent about 20, 30 minutes there, and I thought, wow, God, I don't know what you're going to do with this service, but I can't preach tonight. And pretty soon the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you know, Nathan, in 30 minutes, the service will start. And they will sing songs and they will take the offering and they will make announcements and then you're going to be up. You just got to suck it up. <laughs> do what you got to do. So I thought, go in the pastor's study. And I'll, I'll open up Psalm 18. And, and, and I'll just read there. And I'll just, I'll just force my mind to get a hold of that. And I'm reading down through there, and all of a sudden, something happened. In fact, three things happened time was simultaneously. I was reading in Psalm 18, and I got to verse 16. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. 
He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. In the parsonage where I was staying, in my guest bedroom, there was a picture of Jesus I'd never seen before. It was a very contemporary Jesus, pencil drawn, and he had a lamb. And he had it tucked right up under his chin. And it was just this most contented look on that lamb's face. And when I read those verses, they, they just lit up like a neon light in my Bible. And all of a sudden, two arms went around me. And God picked me up and tucked me right under his chin and just held me there for two or three minutes. And all that darkness vanished. And then he sat me down. And I could hardly wait for him to quit singing. I was ready to preach Psalm 1833. And it just, the, the revival just caved in that night. They lined the alders all the way across and two rows deep. And it went on Saturday night like that. And it went on Sunday morning like that. And Sunday night. And I knew somebody had struck heaven for me. But I had no idea who. And so I left that from there, and, and quite often I would leave because our, our son was young then, and I would drive all the way home so I could be with him on Monday because I left. Revivals were Tuesday over Sunday back in those days, and we would have pizza Monday night. That's his favorite food. I'd like do my laundry, and I'd leave Tuesday morning, and he'd go to school. So I had this little practice, and my, and my wife Linda knew that. She always put the mail out on my desk because she knew even if I came in at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to read the mail. And I'm thumbing through the mail, and there's this letter from Karen, Kristen's mom. And she said, ever since you were here, she said, first of all, I just want to tell you that God used you to minister to us so wonderfully while you were here. We've, ne we've never had anybody be able to talk to us and share with us and put such hope in us. And she said, we cut your picture out of the revival flyer, and... and I'll tell you how long ago this was. It used to be Herald of Holiness. <laughs> she said, we cut your schedule out, and we put both of them on a magnet on your refrigerator. And she said, the other day, and she said, I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget. She said, I think it was when you were in Colorado. She said, we were sitting at the supper table. And she said, Christian said, I wish Brother Covington was here. If he's here, I'd just give him a big old hug. She said, well, sweetheart, that's how we all felt, because God used him so wonderfully to minister to us. She said, Mom, I want to pray for him. She said, okay. So she bowed her head and she said, Dear God, help Brother Covington wherever he is and give him a hug and a kiss for me. And then she looked up at her mom and she said, He hugged him. Oh, did he hug me. Two weeks later, Linda and I returned Kristen's hug in person in Shreveport. <laughs> and I bought her that picture and superimposed over it Psalm 18, 16 through 19. And put it in her favorite colored frame. And I told her mom and dad, I said, when she turns 16, I'm going to come back and sit down with her and tell her what this meant to me. And just before her 17th birthday, I did and bought her a Bible with those verses underlined. <laughs> I want to tell you, God listens to you when you pray. He listens to children. In fact, sometimes they're better at it than we are because they, they're so believing and so trusting. You and I have allowed ourselves as adults to get skeptical and question and wonder. I want to challenge you to take God at his word, okay? And believe him for his promises. And watch what begins to happen in your personal life and in this church.
Okay, come past her. Where's that? Thank you. I think tonight we just need a little bit of a, um, a, a moment just to pause. And I know students, they'll probably be like knocking on the door soon. We have a few moments. I just sense there's probably uh, someone who needs to receive a hug from the Lord tonight. And then there's probably um, some needs that you're just praying that a person would receive a hug from the Lord. Understand? You have some that come to mind? And so here's what I'd like us to do. I just kind of the proximity thing, if it's okay. There's just something about movement that's good for us. I'd like for all of us just to stand. I'd like for all of us to come right up here toward the front. You can gather around the altars. You can kneel at the altar. You can come stand up here with us. Okay, go ahead and just come on up. You've got to hurry because the student's going to be coming in soon, okay? <laughs> Some of you... You're just wanting Jesus just to draw you close. And there's been mothers and grandmothers, probably been some little kids who've prayed for you. And tonight, would you just allow Jesus to hug you close? I mean, the warmth of a hug, the, the warmth of a kiss... Holy Spirit, we just open up our heart. We're asking tonight that we would receive. And the prayers of so many who have prayed for specific people here. It wouldn't take long to look around the room. But we've been prayed for, haven't we? And Jesus wants to answer that prayer. And then, I believe the Holy Spirit's brought someone to your mind. And you've prayed for him in the past. Oh, have you prayed for him in the past? In times of need, you have prayed for them. In times of distance, and not just because of miles, but because of an attitude or spirit, you have prayed for them. And I just simply ask, would we, and I, I have one on my mind, would we just pray once again, Jesus, draw him close. Oh, Jesus, draw him close. And may they experience the loving strength of God in their life. And just as we have wrapped our arms around someone, we've buried our head, and they're in their shoulder right there. Lord Jesus, it's our prayer that this person that comes to our mind, that they would allow their lives to be placed in your hands, Jesus, and that loving arms wrapping around them and draw them close. And oh God, would you hold them tight. And I pray that they would not let go of this moment. And so, Lord, we believe it's going to happen. And it's happening now. And the prayer, just like little Kristen praying, we're praying as well. I pray that would happen for our students this weekend. I pray that that would happen for our kids this moment. And Lord, it's our prayer that we would experience and know perfect love that's for our lives. And so, Lord, thank you for a family, church family. Lord, we long to learn more about prayer and not just make it knowledge in our mind, but that it would become a practice of our heart. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you for the good reminder. We want to continue to 
look to you. Allow your hands to wrap over our hands and for us to do what you have in store as we join together partners with you, Jesus. We love you. Thank you for this moment now. Pray, Holy Spirit, just overwhelm this room as the kids come in. And uh, Lord, we pray that their retreat, the revival of the retreat would begin tonight. So Lord, we thank you for ministering to our spirit. Thank you for Nathan, keep him safe as he travels. Bless him in a real way. We love you, Jesus. We all say amen and amen.